Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, things have been uh, been kind of rough. I had a, a great weekend in St. Louis for my niece's bat mitzvah, but now I've got an infected wisdom tooth and all sorts of pain like I'd never had before. So I'm, I'm just going to try and get this out uh, so you get to listen to a conversation. The past guest and friend, Carl Stevens, has a new book out this week. It's an ecological horror graphic novel called Mother Nature from Titan Comics. And it's adapted from a screenplay by Oscar winner Jamie Lee Curtis and Russell Goldman. It is trippy, scary, a lot of fun to read. Um, it features Carl's trademark, you know, naturalist style and, and his gorgeous watercolors. And when things get weird and, and, and trippy, uh, he really manages to, to meld the unreal into that that visual world that he set up for the reader, and it's it's interesting seeing how he works from a from a script from a cinematic idea into the into the comics page. It's um I can't go on my my mouth is killing me. Mother Nature is a blast. Um, go get it at your favorite comic shop or bookshop. Carl Stevens, Jamie Lee Curtis, Russell Goldman, so it might be listed under different persons' names. But anyway, as caveats go, Carl and I recorded this in June when I was up in Boston for the uh, the bio annual meeting, and uh, the mics were kind of high, so there's there's a little um, clipping that goes on in some of the, the sections. My bad. Uh, he also bumped the table a bit, and that, that got picked up. And I was drinking a glass of ice water, which clinks a little on and off and his phone dinged a couple of times anyway whatever it all sounds better than i sound right now and that's the important thing now here's carl's bio from mother nature carl stevens is a graphic novelist and painter whose comics have appeared regularly in the new yorker village voice and boston phoenix his graphic novels include whatever the lodger failure the winner and penny a graphic memoir he lives in Boston with his wife, Alex, and their cats, Penny and Pepper. And now, the 2023 Virtual Memories Conversation with Carl Stevens. So, Mother Nature, where'd it come from? And, and you know, tell me about the project. I've got, I've got the, um, the creator's statements about it from the book, but mm -hmm. fill me in. Well, it's a crazy project that, um, uh, where did it begin? Well, okay. Um, speaking of the New Yorker, um, Jamie, uh, collects New Yorker cartoons and, um, this is how we made first contact. She, uh, reached out to me in 2019, um, uh, because she wanted to buy, uh, one of my cartoons. And so she like reached out to me on, on Twitter <laughs> And so, you know, I like wrote her back and said, yeah, of course, you know, it's like available and she bought it. And then, um, we just ended up staying in touch and, you know, we would, you know, like text each other stuff that we were working on. Um, and, um, you know, there was a connection with the sobriety too. Like I'd given her a copy of, of the winner, um, when I sent the, mm -hmm. um, New Yorker cartoon. And so, you know, like, as you know, that's all about. Um, you know, like me getting sober. So anyways, so we were friendly and then, uh, like around 20, like the summer of 2020, she sent me, uh, this script that she had written, um, with this young filmmaker named Russell Goldman and it was called, uh, mother nature. And, you know, it was this really cool story about, uh, this native American, um, family that gets caught up in the machinations of this evil energy company in New Mexico. And, um, it's also about this, uh, Navajo spirit that basically takes like revenge on all the evil people. 
mm-hmm. in the company, the Cobalt Co- Corporation. But um, you know, it was um, it's a uh, eco horror story. You know, in the in the tradition of um, you know, like Soylent Green yeah. and all those '70s stuff. And uh, Jamie actually uh, had the idea um, in the late '70s. Um, I think. Yeah, when she was 19. Wow. Um, and, but, uh, like, initially it was about um, this company that was mining in this mountain and, you know, like, destroyed this mountain and, you know, the spirit of the mountain, uh, you know, was unleashed. And, like, you know, that's how it yeah. became. Yeah. So, um, you know, so, like, she had been thinking about it for, you know, about 40 years. And then, um, after like the recent Halloween movies, uh, she decided to like revisit it and, but you know, she didn't really, um, know how to like write a script yet. So she hired Russell to do it. Um, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm probably getting this wrong, but, but it ends um, up in your hands. Yeah. 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 I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm just trying to tell the whole story. <laughs> I'm like rambling about the history, but, um, yeah. And then, so I'm um, like Russell, like, you know, he was like a friend of someone that, uh, he was like the son of a friend of um, hers, and uh, he changed it around. Cause, like uh, originally, it was um, all the female characters were like male, so it was like very like male driven. And Russell said, you know, we should make this about women, and then you know it makes more sense with Mother Nature and yeah. everything. And um, so yeah, so I mean, like when I when she sent me the script, it was probably like the third or fourth draft. Um, but it was it was in production to be a film too. Um, uh, like uh, Blumhouse, like had already bought it, and so you know I so I wrote Jamie back after I read it, and I was you know I said this would make a really cool graphic novel. You know, would you consider doing that? And you know, she's like, that's a fucking amazing idea. <laughs> so she talked to Blumhouse, and um, you know they were on board so and then they found a publisher which ended up being uh titan in the uk because i believe they do like a lot of licensed Mm -hmm. projects and you know also give out um you know uh sustainable contracts sustainable (laughs) advances and so uh so yeah i mean it was so it was like six to eight months of agents fighting about who owns what Mm -hmm. and whatnot and then um i got the green light to go and then um, it was, they left me completely alone, both Titan and Jamie and Russell. I mean, well, Jamie and Russell, you know, uh, helped me with it, but, you know, I was, um, left to come up with all the visuals and like the narrative, uh, the, like, like visual narrative, yeah. you know, completely, uh, on my own. And so, you know, like, like the whole look and everything, you know, like how the characters look and everything. I mean, it's basically, uh, like my version of, of their script. It's like my adaptation of it, uh, which is like how I consider it. I mean, you know, it, it could have been, you know, it's, it's, it's like if I was adapting, say, you know, like Shakespeare or something, you yeah. know, I'm just like taking like their text and like doing like my own interpretation of it. So, uh, what they do with the movie, um, and, you know, it's, I mean, I'm, it's unclear whether or not they're going to take references, but um, yeah, so I mean, that's kind of like a long short of it. And then it took me about two years to, to draw it. Um, the like initial deadline was, uh, really unsustainable. Like they wanted me to get it done for, <laughs> yeah, we talked in 2021 and you sent, I think you said something to the effect, I mean, you told me off mic stuff mm-hmm. also, but that it was like that fall you were thinking of finishing out. It's like, it sounds <laughs> yeah. like a lot of pages, but he, he's the artist here, not me. So, yeah, I mean, it was yeah, that was being delusional. Um, but yeah, I mean, optimistic, like, <laughs> not delusional. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, optimistic. Yeah. Um, but you know, like they were flexible. I mean, really, like their timetables were about, you know, either like the New York Comic Con or the San Diego Comic Con. Like they, you know, they wanted to make it a big uh, debut. So, um, so like originally it was supposed to be fall of twenty two for New York Comic Con, but you know, now it's. Yeah. 23 for San Diego Comic-Con, which is a lot better, you know, since Jamie won the Oscar and... So you've now worked with an Oscar winning <laughs> uh, artist, I guess. I know, right? oh my God, I was like so like nervous. I mean, we like watched it. Yeah. <laughs> I was like really, really <laughs> hoping. I was like, oh, I mean, you know, it's just, yeah, I mean, she, she truly deserves it. I mean, just, you know, after like 40 years of being in, in the industry and, you know, I mean, I think she even said it in her speech, you know, just... 
you know, it, it was like a win for uh, like genre stories, you know, because yeah. typically they don't get nominated for anything. So, and you yeah. know, and like she was great in that role. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. that was a blast. You know, <laughs> yeah. I, I love the daughter more, but I understand that, you know, as far as performances went, yeah, you know, especially with the sausage fingers, but you know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> So gross. But, but tell me about the that that sort of act of adaptation. You know what what it was like for you. Well, uh, adapting this particular you know project, knowing you know that it's not dead authors that you're you're picking up on. These are people who you know are still actively involved in the property, the story, whatever it is. But what was it like for you? You know, adapting it. Uh, well, mostly it was a it was a formal exercise for me. I mean, yeah. like that's how I approached it. It was like, okay, like I have all this text, you know, how am I going to break this down into a comic book? And so and not be a storyboard, and not be a storyboard. Yeah, right. I mean, well, I I haven't really done any storyboards, so um, like the only visual um, type of. Uh, narrative that I understand is comics. Sure. So, um, so I, I guess I was thinking about it that way, like as I was reading it. Um, so it was, you know, more just, I was, I, I was studying a lot of the, um, you know, superhero comics that I grew up on and like how they approached it. And, you know, I mean like all the, all the good ones, you know, all the Alan Moore stories, you know, like how, uh, like those, you know, artists like dealt like with his text because, you know, there was a similarity because, you know, Alan Moore's um, scripts are famously verbose. Yeah. And did you ever hear my David Lloyd interview? <laughs> yeah, I did, um, yeah. yeah. So where David's like, no, <laughs> he, 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 either he was not that guy back then or I would have kicked him in the ass if he tried handing me that much text. So, yeah, but, yeah, yeah. So it was like similar, you know, yeah. I mean, because it's just, there was like a lot of like descriptors, but it's, you know, um, it's just like a matter of balancing um, that, you know, like, like, you know, taking all the like descriptors and like, you know, using that as like a visual, like jumping point sure. and then taking the dialogue and using the dialogue as a way to guide the eye, like through the page, you know, which is what you're, you know, I do anyways, what you're supposed to do yeah. is that because, you know. Um, and that's what the, I wonder, the, just, just what that's like looking at pages that are intended for another medium that mm -hmm. also don't have a, they don't have a visual yet. You know, there isn't a film that you were basing everything on, but a, a right. script and, and what it's like sort of inventing that, uh, you know. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, you know, I've, I've basically like directed my own movie. Yeah. I mean, you yeah. know, like, you <laughs> that's know, a good way I, of putting it. I mean, like Jamie has like, you know, said that in uh, other interviews and it's just, I mean, it's, it's true. I mean, you know, like I'm like choosing like everything, you know, and um, so yeah, I mean, you know, I was watching a lot of films. I, I do anyways. I mean, you know, my style is, um, very naturalistic and like realistic. Uh, so it's, there is, you know, it's not a giant leap to, um, to like films, you know, I mean, it's yeah. like very similar. I mean, I, I think of my books as, you know, films on paper. So, um, it was, uh, it was a lot easier than I thought it would be once I got into it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, like I'll admit, I mean, like when I, you know, first, you know, like got the green light, I was definitely like nervous. Cause I mean, this is, I mean, just stylistically and like the story was this completely, uh, the opposite of like anything that like, I've done before. I mean, like the bulk of my work is, you know, primarily, um, autobiographical or, you know, it's fictional, but it's, you know, like within, you know, you it's, do it's the cosmic trippy stuff too, periodically, but yeah, but yeah, it's true. But I mean, it's, it's not as practiced. So in like, you know, like this story is, was, you know, mostly just, you know, people talking. So, I mean, which is my strength, but you know, but people talking in New Mexico, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, like native American characters and, you know, so just being aware that, you know, I'm, you know, was drawing, um, well, I mean, you know, like Navajo characters too, just making sure that, you know, they look like Navajo characters, you know, there's like the whole <laughs> like yeah. history of like Hollywood, you know, like <laughs> not doing that. So, you know, just making sure that I got all of my like references correct and, 
you know, it is a fictional town, but uh, we did go to uh, New Mexico, and you know, I, I took a lot oh, of photos. I was going to ask whether you, you did a yeah, 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 just like, just Google imaging, or you actually went out and did stuff. Yeah, it was great. like it was yeah. a, like a little bit of both. I mean, mm -hmm. we were going. Alex and I were going to um, the Grand Canyon, anyways, which I know is in Arizona, and people from New Mexico will, you know, yeah. <laughs> make a big point that <laughs> you know, like the landscape is different. So you know, I did um, go there and like you know get a sense of. Um, of place and you know that that really helped mm -hmm. um, you know it's just because you know like a lot of the story is about uh, landscape I mean obviously because yeah. the you know the cobalt yeah. Yeah. company is you know destroying the landscape so you know I, I wanted to have like a lot of vistas in there to really show like you know like what had happened to the place and also you know like what it could have been and everything so it was it was, it was very important to get the setting right so what'd you learn about storytelling from this? Um, I mean, a lot of it is just like formal, like drawing stuff. Yeah. Um, because I mean, you know, I use like a lot of, uh, photographic reference for my work and like in the past I've been lazy and just, you know, if I use a character or like a model, I will have that character look like the model. Whereas this time around, I really only use myself and Alex and, well, I mean, I used a couple of my friends as models, but, um, you know, I was doing things that had I stayed in art school, I probably would have learned <laughs> like, you know, pasting faces over bodies, you know, I mean, like I, or, you know, like using like my body as, as a model, but then, you know, putting someone else's face, yeah. you know, on it, you know, I mean, just like tricks like that, that I just never learned. So, I mean, that's, that's something that I, uh, had to learn and get good at, you know, over the course of this project. Cause there was just no other way to do it. Cause I was on deadline, you know, I, I couldn't just have like a model at my beck and call, you know, whenever I just had to get it done. So, so I like really learned, uh, how to draw in a completely different way. You know, it wasn't just drawing from observation. It was, you know, uh, like thinking about, um, you know, like, all the stuff like I'd learned, but like in different ways, you know, just uh, like thinking about like lighting more, uh, composition, you know, just, I mean, all the basic stuff that goes into making a drawing, it was just, um, you know, having to, you know, like just really think about like just yeah. taking all these separate elements and like combining them into one. I mean, it was almost like making a, a collage for me, like in a lot of ways, but you know, but, it, but it's all drawn from observation. I mean, you know, yeah. Um, but you're you're synthesizing a lot more. Yes, yeah, you think? Yeah, I guess that's the word. I've was, sounds good. I was yeah. going to go with integrating, but I think synthesizing works better. <laughs> yeah, than yeah, it, too. It, yeah, it's, yeah, it's more synthesizing. I mean, you know, it's um, I I pulled it off. I think uh, for the most part. I mean, I was I was looking at it earlier, like before you came over, and you know, there are definitely some panels where <laughs> I wish I could redraw. <laughs> yeah, that's that's <laughs> that's how it goes. That's also the. The peril of any long form work it's is, true, you yeah. know, a lot of guys tell me that, oh yeah, we, I go back and redraw the, the first chapter or two because it took me a while to figure out what the style was and, and, you know, how to do this one or that one. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think went into this, um, I, you know, like having come off Penny and I just decided, well, you know, Penny is very, you know, kind of traditional, like comic book looking style with like the black line and like the color over, but you know, it's, it's, it's all painted, you know, with like watercolor. I don't use digital for anything. Um, so I had already locked into that style on the penny book. So I just, you know, just like use those techniques. So do you see things you learned from this process feeding back into your, we'll say more personal? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, um, or did you need a gigantic break after finishing this and didn't draw anything for a while? No, <laughs> okay. no, no, no. I, I have really bad, uh, graphomania. I mean, I have to draw every day. Otherwise I get very ornery yeah. and angry. I mean, you know, there is, um, there's a story that Alex always tells about, uh, when we were on our honeymoon, uh, in, in, um, Hawaii for, uh, like 10 days, um, about like four days into it. Like I hadn't really been doing any drawing, just kind of sketching. And we were on this beautiful beach and there were people like riding horses. It was this like <laughs> this beautific thing. And I just like sat down and I just was like having a breakdown because like I like couldn't, 
you know, I like didn't have time to like draw and she's like, but like we're in par we're in literal paradise and you're and like, you just want to be, you know, in a dark room. It's your paradise is you know, <laughs> sitting there with your, your hand under the paper. That's, that's, I know. <laughs> it was a weird thing. I hadn't drawn for a bit. And, and again, I, you know, I only have like two years of this, <clears throat> but I had this moment on a train back from a uh, uh, DC where I took out a, 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 a pocket brush that a, um, Kate LaCour had given me a while ago. And it was just having the weight of it in my hand. It just, oh, oh yeah, this is what I'm missing. I, I need to do this again because <laughs> I yeah, yeah. let everything get away from me. And just that, that tactile thing or the weight of it is, it's, it's, it's magic. It's true. Yeah. I mean, well, that's what it's all about. Um, you know, I've, I've been using like the same type of pen nib since I was 13. Yeah. So, you know, like over 30 years now, <laughs> <laughs> you know, with the, um, like Hunt 102, uh, like Croquil and, um, and you know, like that's what I found out that like cartoonists were using back then in the early nineties. Yeah. One issue with the comics journal must've mentioned it somewhere. And boom, it, it oh, just yeah. locked in. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, no, it, it was probably the journal. Um, and yeah, so, I mean, you know, I just got one and just had been practicing with it but, but like now like I, I just have you know such like a like sixth sense of you know how much you know ink is like on like that nib at like all times like you know I can feel that like you know subtle shift of like weight mm -hmm. and it's you know it, it's really like just become you know um it's just like you know like like having that touch I guess like just comes from that that like muscle memory but you know that 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 like subtlety of like weight you know, that's just something like you learn from, mm. you know, doing it for so long, I guess. So, Why? but, I got but it like makes to... you like <clears throat> Sorry. quicker, you know, yeah. <laughs> too. You know, do, do you find yourself uh, interested in trying to change things up? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I do. I, well, I mean, you know, I've, I've been like evolving, you know, I mean, like when I first started doing uh, comics professionally, you know, I was doing it in this very heavily, uh, you know, crosshatch, oh, sure. like, yeah. you know, modeled style. And, you know, I've, I've slowly, you know, like as I've added color to my work, you know, it's, it's been, you know, evolving away from that, but, you know, it goes back and forth, but I mean, I guess like other media, um, I've, I've like thought about it, about, you know, working in like pastels or something, or even like oil paints, but, um, it really just depends on the project, you know, like I, I try to match each project with what I think would look best so i just haven't had the opportunity to really think about experimentation i mean you know i i, I do have a copy of cages by dave mckean you know, i always pull that out every now and then and think you know i should really do something and, <laughs> like, and again we're close like enough that. in age to to know that like the expectation of that book mm -hmm. given that like everything we knew of mckean was that painted sandman cover oh, sure, yeah, and, those, like, and collage cupboards and to see what he just well, no, I don't have to do anything like that at all. I can do a completely different style and I can also write, you know, just as a college kid at the time, just blew my mind. Oh know? yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. yeah. Same thing. I mean, I was, I was, I was in high school and yeah, that, I mean, um, I couldn't afford it until later, <laughs> but well, I mean, I would definitely it, you, go to like the, <laughs> yeah, you, you know, the story though, that Tundra was losing money on every copy. Oh yeah. 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 That yeah was I the, know uh, that. Well, I got for it in volume. You're like, no, that's literally the definition of how you go out of business. But yeah, that's, <laughs> it didn't matter because they brought cages into the world. Oh. And that's, that's, you know, that whole Northampton yeah. scene is very close to my heart. <laughs> I, know, I mean, I know. you know, I, I don't know if you talked about it on mic, but it's, it was, uh, like very formative. I mean, when I was in high school, um, Kevin Eastman had the words in pictures museum up and running. Yeah. And as soon as I got my license, I mean, that's literally like the first place I went was to, um, was to the words and pictures and i mean it was such like a you know just you know like having i mean you know i grew up in the country and you know we didn't uh go to art museums like at all like okay. growing up so you know to like see this like original art that you know i had only seen in you know like reproduction but like there on the wall you know seeing like a crumb drawing that was yeah. just caked and like white out you know seeing uh, that like, they needed white out yeah yeah, they, yeah, yeah. That they needed, it just completely like humanized them actually there was like he had a um like one of the big spreads of bernie wrightson's uh frankenstein oh, yeah. and it was it was like in the lab so like all the beakers and yeah. everything and like right in the middle was like this giant mound of of whiteout and like that just that was like just that's like all i needed yeah, to bernie see bernie wrightson made a mistake yeah bernie wrightson it. made a mistake yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but to me it was and i think when i was in hampshire up through 93 i think he had mm -hmm. like 
the roundhouse in Northampton. He was showing stuff there, but didn't have the full words and pictures. I think I had to come back to, to see the full uh, museum. Museum. What, what was the roundhouse? I don't know it it was that. a building sort of behind that, uh, off, off that main street in Northampton, where he okay. had, you know, I think he was renting that and showing some stuff. Oh, wow. And to me, and again, again, I'm sure other people have earlier historical moments like this, but um, that was the first seeing comic art on the wall. You right, because oh, it wasn't the same for you. Too. Yeah, it wasn't yeah. something that was art. It was just comic books, and this sure. is the first time it was. No, this deserves to be you know framed and and shown, and you have to see it like this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then going back and seeing the the actual museum a few years later was was all that. I did get up to, to Northampton and Amherst last November. Um, oh, cool! I recorded a, a show with someone, and then uh, decided, well, I got here at eight a.m. I may as well walk around and and see my old campus and and you know stumble into Emily Dickinson's grave, which I. Did yes. not bother to look for when I was there for four years <laughs> back in my, my college days. But um, I mean, but yeah, it's okay to come to Dickinson late. I did too. <laughs> I read two pages every morning and, and try and figure out what the hell's you know going on with some of them and other ones. I'm like, oh, this makes sense. So, um, but yeah, it, it's it's just the going back to the uh, making the the point of going over to Northampton afterwards and thinking. Mm -hmm. Everything's gone. Like, yeah, everything, everything I loved is, gone. is sort of gone. But you know, yeah. these are the places, and this is where Words and Pictures was, and this is where the comic store was. The uh, um, Main Street Records with the comic oh. shop downstairs in the, the the basement where I used to yep. hunt down Kyle Baker comics and things like that. Because yeah. <laughs> because you could, <laughs> yeah, it's a different world back then, man. It is, yeah. Right, I remember that store. I know. I mean, like, because I grew up probably halfway between uh, Northampton and Boston. So, you know, that's, you know, like once we, we got our licenses and like a friend of mine, um, you know, uh, got a car. I mean, it was like every weekend it's like, okay, we're going to Cambridge this weekend or we're going to Northampton. But, you know, it was an ex because like what was going on in Cambridge too was like the whole high water scene with, uh, Tom Not Devlin sure. and, and like he was having shows too. I mean, like I, I remember going to a show in Somerville that Tom had put together of, uh, all the artists that he was publishing. Um, so I guess it was like Megan Kelso and like Brian Ralph. Um, uh, who else? Uh, um, like Dame Darcy was there, but like he wasn't being published or like Tom Hart and Leela Corman. So, I mean, it was just, you know, I mean, it's a very like, uh, you know, fertile scene, oh, I yeah. guess. And, but, you know, but like I was so young and, you know, I mean, I was, you know, like still a it's teenager. It's weird, just a few years. Yeah. Like, like such the, a big the, amount. Yeah, you know? it did. I mean, I was, you know, I was probably like 19, 18, 19, like 20. And, you know, like they were all in their mid 20s yeah. to like 30, you know. So it was, you know, they were like the cooler older brothers. And, you know, I always felt like an outsider. I mean, I was always pestering Tom to, to like, you know, publish. Because, you know, of course I was, you know, making my own comics. And like at that point, you know, like they had evolved into you know, more, um, like, you know, they, they had more like literary pretensions, you know, I was trying to make, you know, stories about my friends and stuff. And so, you know, I thought, you know, naively that Tom would be into them, but he wasn't, I mean, you know, he was on like a whole, I mean, like the aesthetic back then for indie comics was like the opposite of what I was doing. Cause I was already experimenting and, you know, doing realism and, you know, using photography as reference. And that was like, that was the opposite of what they wanted. Oh, it's like know. a bunch of years ago, I was at uh, RISD for the Fort Thunder exhibition they did. Oh, yeah, and yeah. I was like, I get it. Just not my style. <laughs> you know, like I understand why this is important. This is just not a, you know, a form of, of comics and art that I would have grokked, you know, back then. It's just, you know. Yeah. I mean, the same thing. I mean, like I, I got it. And, you know, like having gone to art school, I mean, that was just what was popular. And my impulse and what I was always drawn to was people who were doing the opposite. So, you know, that like crude kind of, you know, like psychedelic, you know, like nonsense. Um, you know, I, I guess, you know, it, it all comes from like, like Gary Panter or something, sure. you know, yeah. like that. I mean, that was what was cool and what was popular. And, you know, I made a conscious decision that I didn't want to do that. Cause I didn't, I didn't want to look like everyone else, you know, I mean, actually, you know, I enjoyed like drawing, you know, like I enjoyed going to art museums and like, you know, studying, you know, old masters. And, you know, I, I didn't think that they should be, re you know, like rejected. I mean, yeah. you know, like 500 <laughs> years of like, <laughs> you know, like Canon and, you know, just good drawing, you know, shouldn't just be discarded because it's, you know, not cool. <laughs> no. 
No, no, so, yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, that made me not cool. So, I mean, like, that was the price I paid, I guess. And look at you now, working with an uh, Oscar-winning artist. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. by, by the way, and you mentioned the drawing from models and, and faces. Mm -hmm. um, realistically drawing Jamie Lee Curtis, who's basically a character in, in, in the book. You've got oh, someone yeah. who looks very, very, very much like her. Oh, thanks. Uh, um, a, how much of a challenge? B, were you nervous about her seeing it? And, and that doesn't look, or that looks too much, or... Oh, you know. no, I mean, um, you know, I, I didn't know that... Well, that that's the character that I believe she is going to play. Yeah, sure. In yeah. the in the film, and I believe she's also going to direct it as well. Mm -hmm. um, so I just um, didn't know if you felt you know either challenged or yeah, you know, just yeah, yeah. nervous with her looking into you yeah, kind of. <laughs> I mean, I guess. I mean, it was um, no. I mean, like she was she was pretty easy to draw. I mean, it's you know she has very like distinct uh, sure. features. So. But yeah, I mean, I was I was happy that she you know liked it. I mean, like when she first started seeing them, she was she like said it was creepy. <laughs> <laughs> but I took that as a compliment. <laughs> and again, it's not stalkery fan art, so so that's okay. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Although you do have the well, I mean, the working from the script, as you said, you know, supernatural horror uh, uh, genre. Is that a form you're into, horror and gore particularly? Um, not until recently. Okay. Um, so I had to adopt it for this? <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of. I mean, you know, I've, um, I liked horror movies, but I was definitely not one of those kids growing up. You know, I was, um, you know, I mean, you know, like all my friends who I, you know, collected comic books with and, you know, played D&D &D with, uh, they were all into horror movies, but that was like the one genre that I never got into. I mean, it wasn't until later. Um, and I still have um, some blind spots, but... I am now. I mean, I'm actually writing um, a vampire story that uh, will probably be what I'm doing next. Yeah. So, and so I've, I've really gotten into it. And I'm writing with a friend of mine who's a, a film scholar and a writer. So um, he's, he's really pushing me to, you know, I mean, he has a whole list of films we have to watch okay. and, you know, like really understands, I mean, genre in general, I mean, films as well, but... Um, so we've just been like the past like few weeks, just been doing a deep dive into it. So, um, but you know, I, I, I really, uh, I really enjoy it. I mean, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it, you know, it's like a challenge. I mean, it's something I haven't done before and I, I definitely want to explore it. I mean, at least with this next hmm. vampire story too, but it's, but it's completely inspired by, you know, working on mother nature. Yeah. Yeah, so I wondered whether Obviously, you know, this yeah. is something you uh, you adopted for the sake of the book and then found, ah, oh, some interesting stuff. Yeah. Now, let me ask, when it comes to, to that genre, is it the sort of the visual and the storytelling that, that appeals to you at this point? Like watching it and figuring out how would this become a comic or is there yeah. something else? Because, again, this isn't about storyboarding. It's about creating something that can only be comics, comics. So. Well, there's like a... There's like a similar uh, brevity into the like in the storytelling between film and comics, and like that's what I I guess I'm exploring is like okay like you know how do I tell the story in a very simple and succinct way that is also you know interesting and uh, visually exciting. So um, so yes, I mean like when I'm watching a film, I definitely think about how that would be translated into comics you know um and but you know it, it's such like an intuitive sure unconscious thing it's like hard for me to articulate exactly what oh, that again, is if it I mean, could it would suck yeah that's, that's yeah i mean you know it's it is you know like a lot of it is like composition you know like you know how certain you know um you know scenes are like uh Framed and you know, like the like transition between each scene, you know, like how that would translate as like on one page or over the course of like two or three pages, you know, it's just all, you know, it all just kind of like becomes this soup that you have to, you know, try to figure out. <laughs> That's a bad analogy <laughs> that you need to figure out the recipe for. There, there you go. Figure out the, the recipe thing. for. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, I mean, yeah, yeah, it's 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 it's. It's like hard for me to like articulate it because I am such an intuitive artist, you know. And yet, you know, again, working in such a naturalist, realist style, you know, it, um, I would say it gives a, a um, I would say betrayal. It's not it. it, it there's a, 
um, the way one would see, you know, something that's that that formal in, in scale, you'd think, oh, this is very thought out, very hyper intellectualized. Mm -hmm. But the idea that again, it, it can develop intuitively and then come out in this this you know perfectly formed line is is yeah it makes your work interesting it's an interesting dynamic <laughs> or tension within it i guess yeah yeah i mean well there is like a lot of you know anxiety about like every panel i mean there is like a lot of um you know like trial and error i guess hmm. so and uh especially with mother nature i've you know i did a lot of uh, like more layouts than, you know, like more uh, thumbnails for the pages yeah. than I've, I've ever done before. Um, so, you know, that's, that's something else that is that like how the, like what I learned from the project is, you know, just doing more drafts than like I normally would have. And it's, you know, led me to like better uh, outcomes, of course, you know, cause it's, you know, I'm like just thinking about it more and I'm not just, you know, okay. Oh, you know, here's the, here's the model that I'm using, you know, here's like the setting, you know, I'm just going to draw it. I mean, but like thinking about it, like from different angles and how it's going to serve like the larger story and, you know, like foreshadowing, you know, like things that will happen later on. And, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's quite a juggling act. actually. It's, it's like I, hard I, to really like, I hate to ask. So does it like make you think of, of trying to make film? Oh yeah, yeah, of course. No, I mean, I'm like writing this vampire story as a film. So, I mean, um, you know, I mean, I know that's, you know, like there's a whole history of cartoonists <laughs> <laughs> for good and bad, for yeah. good and bad that have been sucked into it. But, um, you know, I, I've always been interested in film. So, um, you know, like we'll see. I mean, you know, I, I love uh, drawing comics. You know, again, it goes, you know, back to the story about our honeymoon. I mean, you know, I, I love just being alone in a room and drawing. And I mean, you know, Jamie's even you know, said that to me that she said that I have like the best job in the world. Cause you know, it's just, it's just me, you know, sitting alone and like creating, you know, I mean, film is so like collaborative. Um, but you know, I like working with people and why not? Yeah. We'll see. I mean, you know, I don't have any opportunities at the moment, yeah. but you're open. So. <laughs> yeah. It's a weird question. I don't mean it in a, what's your next project way, but you know, where do you see your art? going you know do, do you see either an arc that's already you know in progress or do you see stages of, of things you want to be able to 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 make um well you or know, is that now, part of the intuition and part of the surprise yeah i mean i i definitely want to do at least another horror comic so um so this next next project but i you know i've i have other projects that i've been developing as well i mean i definitely want to do more graphic novels i mean i i have a romance graphic novel that i i like have to do um at some point that i've been writing for compulsively or contractually you have to it's... no uh compulsively <laughs> okay, good, good. Yeah, yeah yeah um and so I, I definitely want to do that um but i guess i'm i guess i'm staying open i mean it, it was such a nice experience just adapting mother nature that I mean, I would be open to that. I mean, that's something that I, I wouldn't have considered, like, you know, before, you know, like, f like five or ten years ago. I mean, just adapting something. But, like, now, um, having gone through that, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's something that I, I would be open to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's... Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's like, like, like so much can happen. I mean, if, if like, I've learned anything just kind of you know, uh, like floundering in this industry. It's just that, um, you know, like a new project could just present itself yeah. and then, you know, that just becomes the thing. So, I mean, I guess like ultimately like, the short answer is that I just want to keep, you know, uh, just keep working and keep like developing, uh, and just let it kind of naturally happen, you know? Um, so we'll yeah. see. It's just, it, it really is just like day to day, but I've, um, I've, I've, I'm definitely locked into just doing comics, mm -hmm. I think, until, until I can't anymore. Long form, you know? Yeah, 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 definitely long form. I mean, that's more of like a commercial sure, aspect sure. of it just because um, there's no way to publish sh like short stories anymore. I mean, except for The New Yorker, um, which, you know, I'll, I, I still submit to. Um, so, uh, although I was saying before, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely thinking about like covers more. For, for them um 
because because they are interested. <laughs> <laughs> but but also yeah. it's you know um, I've I've always studied uh, like Rockwell. I mean like Norman Rockwell is one of my mm -hmm. you know top ten and you know the way that he can tell the story in a single image is like no other and you know i would like to you know just just do that you know i mean just like try to you know be a storyteller with one image you know is uh like a new challenge so i mean i, I can see myself doing that like maybe like cover work like that would be like the short form work but everything else i think would have to be graphic novel length um you know but it's <laughs> it's just important for me to like stay focused these days. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, instead of just having like a million projects that I'm like thinking about, I, I need to, you know, just focus on one, which is like what I've been doing. But I, I think that's like when you know that it's like the right project, when it starts to really obsess you and you like, start dreaming about it. So, yeah, it puts me in mind of, I think the first or second time I talked with Seth and there was a degree <laughs> of, again, older than us, <laughs> and figuring out how much runway he had, you know. Oh, right. There's yeah. only so much time to, to do projects X, Y, and Z, and I need to finish Palookaville, and then, you know, I need to get this, this, and this done. Because, again, you're at that point late 50s, early 60s, and it's... Right. You start to feel mortality. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, I'm not quite there. I mean, kind of, a, a little bit. I mean, like, my father died a couple of years ago. I mean, he was 76. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, that's 32 years from now, but, but I mean, you know, you, you can go anytime, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, so yeah, I mean, I, I guess I'm not to that point, right? Like when I get to be in my late fifties and sixties, I'll probably, I'll probably feel the same way. I mean, that's, it's interesting though. Cause like I felt that in my twenties, you know, yeah. I felt that, you know, I only have so much time, you know, I have to get, you know, like X, Y, and Z book done by the time I'm 30. And then, you know, like I have to be like at, the, at this point in my career, I mean, yeah, the, the stages you needed to reach. Yeah. 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 I mean, it was, it was I, I feel like, you know, since I've turned 40, it's like that, that voice is uh, quieted mm -hmm. a bit. So, I mean, maybe it's just, you know, having like a little bit of success. It just you've makes achieved it, a bunch of those. Yeah. So, it, yeah. Yeah. I mean, but there's definitely like, it's, it's still there. Like that, that voice. It's like, I'm not, you know, like where I should be and, you know, mm -hmm. like so-and-so is you know, more famous than me. <laughs> and we know. And they're younger than me. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's the issue we'll get to you. And again, at 52, I just look, everybody younger than me is, is a, a ridiculous piece of crap. And God damn it, how can they be achieving things and productive when I'm just this schlub from New Jersey? But right. You did mention last time we talked, uh, wanting to work on a book about your father. Is mm -hmm. that something you, again, that's sort of back burner or? Yeah. You know? I mean, I think about it all the time. Um, and I'm, I'm closer to working on it now. Uh, it's, it's just structure. I mean, I know I have like a clear idea of the structure and like what it's going to take. And it's, it's going to be kind of thorny. Um, so is it something you could have done while he was alive? No, okay, definitely not. Um, just because, I mean, like since his death, you know, I've just like reflected I mean, of course, uh, a lot about his life and, you know, uh, my, and like my immediately, you know, like my immediate family's life and, you know, like how, like his, you know, his experience in like Vietnam, like has, um, you know, really like polluted, like my like whole family yeah. <laughs> and like, you know, how we, um, you know, just interact. I mean, especially like my brothers too. So, I mean, you know, I would... I would want to incorporate like their stories into it as well, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, again, I, I, just, I just keep running into a wall that like I, I can't quite figure out. I mean, I, I was reading an interview, like like an old interview with Art Spiegelman in the '90s uh, in the Comics Journal, where um, and like I learned something like I hadn't learned, which was that um, he didn't start working on Mouse until at least five or six years after his father died. Cause like his father died, I think in 82 or something. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, art didn't really, I mean, you know, he like did that like early yeah, prisoner like, of hell plan. Yeah, yeah, that was prisoner of hell plan. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, he hadn't really like begun working on mouse until after he died. And I thought that was interesting. So, and it just kind of, you know, gave me a new, 
there's that sense of permission yeah, uh, as yeah, a neurotic Jew. I guess, and I think yeah. he may have also had the neurotic Jewish thing of the needing either needing the permission or having to wait till they're gone. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I must be one too then. Yeah. See, <laughs> <laughs> you're honorary. You, you got the neurosis and that's all that counts. But yeah. Yeah. yeah Cause like it is, it is, it is permission. And it's especially with like family too, because yeah. it's like, you know, there's so many moving parts. I mean, it's not just me. I mean, you know, it's like, yes, it's like my experience, you know, dealing with, you know, like his, his trauma, but you know, uh, like my brothers were there too. And like their take on it is completely different. I mean, like I escaped like in a lot of ways, I think. Yeah. And like, you know, they, they weren't so lucky, you know? And there's the, if you cut them out of the story for the sake of their privacy, that will also lead to, Oh, he just wanted to make it all about him. Exactly. And yeah, so yeah, yeah, you're, you're basically, you're damned. You're completely doomed on this project, but go ahead and, and make it anyway. Cause you know, yeah. I mean, it'll be good, but yeah, you're right. It's damned if you do, damned if you don't, and I'm just going to get everything wrong. <laughs> so I just need to like accept that and just try to make a good story. Or you make that part of the story itself, that, that act of what it means to remember, I guess. Yeah. Um, I say this as somebody who doesn't actually produce anything himself, so you know, <laughs> just foisting out projects on other yeah. people. Ding. No, but ding. it's true, though. I mean, it is, it is about memory. I mean, because like, that's like a large... I mean, like, you know, comics are... Uh, good at like because we like think in like s like single images you know I mean that's something I think Chris Ware has like said and you know so like comics are like uniquely qualified to deal with like memoir I think because of that so and you know but using my technique to like make a story like that would be interesting in the sense that you know like I have all these older photographs you know like I was gonna you know, use within the story, but, you know, like draw them. So it would be like seamless, you know, not to like the Nora Krug thing where it's yeah. like, you know, pasting in, but like, you know, really just create a little more Carol this, Tyler like, maybe with the stuff yeah, yeah, about yeah, her dad yeah. where she was redrawing some of the, right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, true. Yeah. yeah. I yeah. forgot that Carol had, do, had done that. So yeah, it would be like similar to like that, but it's just that idea of like, you know, these old photos, which are memories in themselves. And then, you know, working them into a story that's like about memory so it's just like adds like another interesting layer to it so i don't know i mean i i guess again it's just you know thinking about it like formally too much than i am about you know thinking about it emotionally yeah but i do have the first chapter down and i mean you know that's like the story of like how like my father was uh, <laughs> uh like drafted into the war <laughs> which is really crazy um you know, he was so like he like graduated in, um, uh, in uh, 1967 from uh, college, and you know that's when they were wrapping up all the, well, the um, draft, yeah. and you know he and his friends, you know they they're all you know hurrying to like apply to grad school and you know try to get back in college because you know college students were exempt. Um, so during that summer, uh, he had got a job. Um, teaching at this high school, uh, like while he was waiting to hear back about grad school, and you know, I mean, like he was, he was a, uh, you know, um, I forgot like what percentage, but you know, he he graduated like like pretty high in his class, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was a really smart guy, and so he was he like got a job teaching at this local high school, and his uh, draft number came up, and so the draft board went to his superintendent, and you know, asked him if he would, you know, if like he was needed at the high school and, you know, like he was like an important member, yeah. or, like, you know, and, but like the superintendent, uh, who had claimed to be a World War II veteran, but later found out was not, uh, <laughs> said that it would be good for my father to, uh, experience war. It would like be good for his character. Yeah. So then, okay. <laughs> so, so, so there he went. So, but, but like we heard that story, like, you know, like growing up, yeah. you know, from like a family 10. founding myth. Yeah. 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 And I mean, he was just so like, I mean, like the, it was just all consuming with him, like the war. I mean, like, you know, the world was either, you know, people who were experienced it or they were draft dodgers, you know, he was just completely just, he just like hated anyone that like, you know, uh, up, like opposed the war, didn't do it. But, but yet, you know, like I found out later his like politics were, pretty like progressive and you know he like kept up on like what was going on with you know um the like 
the like student protest and you know he like felt like the opposite of like what i thought he felt like growing yeah. up you know i mean like he like didn't vote like in any election until uh 2020 and he voted for biden <laughs> you know i was like that's the one time <laughs> like i like no like you voted important <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Still, know. of all times to make your vote known that's 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 yeah, a good yeah, one yeah. yeah so it was just it was really i mean i like learned like a lot about him you know just like interviewing him just like getting to know him because you know he was such i mean you know he was you know he, he was smart but he was also you know like really into making sure that we were like physically fit and like we played sports and um I, like my older brother like got it more i mean you know like, he was just the better athlete i mean i was bad to like mediocre at best so you can you just know. say a cartoonist yeah <laughs> right i mean once i realized i was a cartoonist in like you know, junior yeah. high i mean that's when i started backing away yeah and, you know, that, that caused problems because, you know, he, you know, had like a very fixed idea of like, you know, what we should be doing. But, but then he like didn't foster, you know, my intellectual curiosity. I mean, he was very anti-intellectual, but he himself was an intellectual. You know, Which could like, be why. But yeah. yeah. Right. Like probably. Yeah. <laughs> Did you feel the book idea progressing further after his death? I guess I mean, it sounds like you've done a lot of thinking since he's been gone. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, it's just... Um, not to put you too much on the spot or put you through a therapy session. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, it's just like structure. I mean, you know, I, yeah. I wanted to open like with that story and then, but like go on from there, I guess. And, but like, I, I can't like figure out whether or not I wanted to, you know, like how much my like family, like I want yeah, to yeah, put it exposed to it yeah. all. I mean, yeah. I have like about eight hours of, interview with him where he's just he's just telling me his uh life story so which is interesting you know i mean it, um you know because like in a lot of ways it's it's kind of like a typical you know story for like a lot of people who you know live in like these small towns and are you know like in, in that part of the 20th century you know and um yeah i mean just like the whole family history is uh kind of bizarre i mean like we've you know like my aunt like did a genealogy and it goes back to this guy in like maine in like the 1720s <laughs> you know? so, so like we're the yeah. and like he fought in the revolution Jeez. you know so it's just like yeah. <laughs> we're like just old you know like just yankee like wasps you know but then we've just been but like we've always been like working class you that's know? gonna say steadily deteriorating yeah as yeah yeah. Generations so, went by. yeah exactly so i mean like i'm not sure i mean you know like there are a couple well like on my mom's side um i know like she was related to uh bruce catton who was like a um who's like a civil war scholar and like wrote a lot of books in the uh like uh, like the 1930s i think mm -hmm. so and one of them was an ambassador to chile uh, like another relative but yeah but like by and large i mean it's you know it is interesting to like be this like new england wasp but like you know be working class yeah, without, without the privilege <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, yeah like, like without, the privilege. without the the you know the, the, the yachting and all that stuff but, yeah, but yeah 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 so and i mean that's something else that my father always like drilled into us i mean you know he said we were right like white trash like on a daily basis mm -hmm. you know and i mean that that definitely comes from like you know, having to go to war and, you know, having his like education, like, you know, cut short. I mean, he like eventually did go back and like get his master's when he came back. Hmm. So, and, you know, was a high school teacher, like when I was growing up. So, <laughs> so to get you off the subject, <laughs> the other big her. thing we talked about in, in 21 was, uh, that you were really deep diving into, um, heavy metal magazine oh, as yeah. opposed to heavy metal which you know <laughs> <laughs> would be one of, with my hair you know god, god knows I, I could fall for the, yeah that whole world um <laughs> what you been binging on or what's the collecting uh, uh vibe been like since then with with comics yeah uh well artist editions yeah <laughs> That's, um well, there's we'll a stack of yeah. them over there um yeah i mean i i guess god like, like what i've been reading um yeah, it's, you know, I've mostly just been looking at, the, like, all the old favorites. Yeah. 
um, that like Starenko book. I was just saying the Starenko Nick Fury is the uh, the. Yeah, I mean, I always go back to him. I guess you know, it's funny. Durf was posting a bunch of the few issues of Starenko's X Men uh, mm-hmm. recently on Twitter and just oh, showing. Yeah. I saw those. How meh he was and how it just took, you know, a couple of months of development and the Nick Fury thing. He was just suddenly revolutionizing the page. And it was like, yeah, he was doing sort of Don Heck knockoffs, you know, six months earlier and then just. Yeah, yeah. He just figured something out. Yeah. I mean, right. Well, he went from Don Heck to Jack Kirby. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I mean, because there is a lot of Kirby in those, uh, like Nick Fury. I mean, of, of course, you know, I mean, he just seemed to, he like made Kirby more um, fluid. Know, like fluid, yeah. I mean, it, it seems like it's like, a, yeah, it's a cross between like Kirby and like Bernie Krigstein or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I usually contrast Kirby and Toth as sort of or the Toth, yeah. But again, it's, it's very difficult to reconcile the. The geometric power on the one side and like the, the, the whip ink on the other. That's which is my weird non artist way of framing it. But <laughs> whip ink? Whip. You know, just the uh, oh, yeah, yeah. thing where the, the characters are sort of that that right, yeah. the figures are, are well, more fluid, again, I, yeah, I think. Yeah. 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 I mean yeah, it's, it's different. I mean like there, yeah, there's obviously something like blocky about Kirby. So, like something very meaty and like solid. And like Toth is yeah, definitely more liquid and like uh, almost like more elegant, I guess. Although, I mean, like my favorite Kirby is the '70s stuff that, like, 2001. <laughs> uh, Things were nuts, you know, like those stories. I mean, uh, like Commandy, uh, the Forever People. You know, I mean, like all the DC stuff. I mean, I think is far superior than yeah. uh, <laughs> than like all the. I mean, you know, I know he created the Marvel universe. Yeah, but, but it's I mean, still... like, but like as an artist, it's like. Yeah. I, I just find it more interesting. He's just, and it's, it's, it's him, you know, it's like the purest, yeah. you know, like distillation. That's what I tell the, I, I got to forget who it was. Maybe it was Ryan Hughes or someone when I was interviewing him or talking with him. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, like my first Kirby exposure as a five or six year old is when he came back to Captain America and those were terrible. Oh, right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's one right. of those like, yeah, th- this really isn't good to look at. And within a couple of months, I'm discovering John Byrne and, and Frank Miller. And it's like, oh yeah, I'll take these guys because, this Kirby stuff is pretty god awful at that point because I was just a few years after all the, the great DC stuff he'd been doing. So, right, right. you know, you go back and you recognize, you know, how great certain things are. But, uh, yeah, he, he, Ryan, I think, uh, excused my not liking Kirby as a youth that, uh, he just figured, <laughs> you know, we got our taste and then you eventually grow into appreciating the great stuff. But, yeah, it's true. I mean, like, I was the same way. I mean, you know, like, Kirby was always old fashioned, you know, but then, like, once you start, like, you know, learning more, Yeah, you know, and, and especially you. drawing too. I right. mean, you know, you like definitely like respect it, but it, yeah, I mean, you know, like I grew up in like the image era, so it was all about McFarlane and Jim Lee and Bravo <laughs> Eiffel. So, but, but like they, they like revered Kirby's work. So, you yeah. know, actually I, I think that was like the gateway in was that like, what was that image comic that he did? Not, not Captain Victory. That was Oh epic, yeah, but um, it was like a one-off thing, and it was like his most best-selling. Yeah, of course, because it had an image yeah. Yeah, uh, imprint on it. Yeah, I forget yeah. the. Uh, but uh, but but like they all inked over him. So yeah. but you know but but <laughs> you know which <laughs> to like some results are better than others. But you know, but yeah, I mean that's definitely how I got into Jack Kirby. Um, um, yeah, I'm trying to think of what else I've been looking at recently. I should have been prepared for this. No, I mean, it just came up when we were talking that you just wanted to go into like the heavy metal uh, mags you'd been picking up and just yeah, how yeah, awesome yeah. it was to to right. uh, really get into some of the uh, the yeah the like all the French work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely like go back to it. Um, you know, pretty often. I mean, like Mobius will always be my favorite uh, comic book artist. I think. Um, you know, it used to be all the EC guys. I mean, I I still look at like Wally Wood and the like, Krigstein like a uh, like every day. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially Krigstein. I mean, I, I I like think about him a lot. Um, you know, especially like working on this adaptation because he was someone who like wasn't a writer, so he was taking and you know like I have the benefit of being a writer. I've, I mean, I've, I've written all of my books, but it's except for Mother Nature. But like the way that he would approach adapting something. And, like, what he did with that limited space, like, I just find, like, endlessly interesting. And, you know, he's he was also very influenced by film, you know, of course. Sure. You know, I mean, like, Master Race, you know, has that great panel of, 
the, like the subway, subway coming yeah, in yeah, and yeah. The, the slicing up the, uh, the exactly the yeah yeah I, I, I like think about that like all the time and like how I can you know steal it in a way that's interesting <laughs> you know not just steal it but like use it so, okay so synthesize synthesize that's, that's gonna be our, synthesize. Our, our term for the, the show <laughs> that's right yeah, that's I'm, right it's not stealing that's it's, right it's, yeah <laughs> or like tom with the uh the, the swipe file back in the uh the, oh. the, the comics journal day. oh my god i was <laughs> i was like like hate seeing that i mean yeah. of course it's just like you know <laughs> art comes from other art you know yeah. like there's an article in the in like the new yorker this week about um that like Ed Sheeran article and Marvin Gaye and like mm -hmm. how he, you know, there's like an Ed Sheeran song that's similar to uh, Let's Get It On and there was like a court case about it, I guess. But uh, but the article talks about how pop music, you know, obviously like, you yeah. know, has been eating itself for years. So, I mean, it's just, I mean, that's just what art is, you know? Right. So it's like you like learn from looking. There was the same thing with the uh, uh, Warhol image of Prince that was oh, right, lifted yeah. so clearly from a photograph and whether that constituted copyright infringement or not because it was being used for commercial purposes of uh, the same commercial purposes as as the image would have been um, right yeah things get a little uh little thorny in, in that respect yeah i know i mean it's, it's it's such a fine line yeah i mean you know i'm not him. I, <laughs> and again so it doesn't matter because everything you do will just be replaced by ai images instead so you know. yeah yeah that's true yeah i always forget about that yeah i know i mean i've i've, I've become more steadfast in my use of uh, actual materials as opposed to simulated ones. And I like saying tr like traditional and digital. I mean, I like actual and simulated. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. I, I always go with analog when nobody gets what that's supposed to be. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Actual. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it is analog, but yeah. Yeah. Actual. Cause it's just, you know, I mean, I, I mean, in like a commercial sense, I mean, you know, I sell like my originals for a lot of money. So it's, you know, it's like an income stream, but it's also, you know, like no, like nothing will like replace you know, like ink on paper or paints on paper, you know, like it's just, it just has like a different quality that like you can't imitate yeah. digitally. I mean, you know, I've like played around with procreate and, you know, it's just, it's just not the same, you know, there's just too much like subtlety that's like lost, you know, I mean like every comic that's drawn digitally just looks like complete dog shit to me, you know, it, yeah. it really just looks like fake and like ugly, you know, like there's no like beauty to it. I think it's impossible. So, um, you know, I mean, I don't care if people do it digitally, but I'm, you know, it's, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting to see like a piece of digital art that's interesting to me. Yeah. So, I mean, like, let alone AI. <laughs> <laughs> that's not art. That's image. But you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I get it. I mean, you know, I, I know that we have limited time that, you know, like, five or 10 years, like Terminators are going to be, you yeah. know, knocking down the door. But <laughs> again, like we were talking about with my own drawing thing, it's not for any, there, there's not going to be any money. There's not going to be any show of my work, et cetera. But the, what I got out of learning to look at something and, and try to draw it is a lot better than figuring out how to write a fucking prompt and, yeah, and yeah. hit enter and say, Ooh, let me, let me rotate this thing and get the light. Okay. This is, you know, my mid journey art or whatever the fuck it is. Yeah. Yeah. I mean like, you know, human beings are way too complex to be, uh, synthesized yeah, to <laughs> machines like that. You know, I mean, you know, I do fear I've given them way too much of my own audio that they're going to be able to, to deep fake my voice really easily. But. <laughs> Probably. I mean, that'd be bad for your day job, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Especially if they run some sort of scandal about me. But, right. uh, but last question. Um, running? Of course. I, I don't know. My body's broken down. I do weights and yoga now instead. So that's, really? that's been my... Yeah, pretty much. I, I you stopped running? Too many problems with uh, the knees, hip, and, and ankle. And I'm just like, okay, I'm just going to get... You know, uh, how often were you running? Unfortunately, the last time when it really broke down, I was about 140 miles a month, and that yeah, and that was my moment of every time I try to rehab and recover, I end up going farther and farther and farther. You know, as I start to feel better, and then breaking down. Yeah. So I seem to be incapable of of moderating myself with that mm. stuff. Uh, right, because you're doing like a lot of long runs with yeah, those friends. The minimum right? was like six, and okay. then on weekends I do 13 to 15 oh, with wow. a, a walking break every mile um, and slow. For the, the long runs. Every mile? Runs. With the you long runs, uh, with 13 to 15, yeah, they would just break every mile, mile and a half for 30 seconds and then, you know, get back to it. Wow. Um, that but, seems like it would be tougher. 
I mean, like any time I stop, like mid run, I just not if you're with people, it's okay. okay. You know, okay. We, we all just okay. Let's get uh, let's get started again. And you know, <laughs> that, that next telephone pole, that's where we're we're going from. Oh, okay. um, and we know the the route. But you sure. know, I walk with the guys sometimes. I, I did um, after months and months with no running. I did like six miles slow, but you know, six miles with a couple of the guys, and uh, that took about five days of of just. My thighs not letting me walk down a flight of stairs, and it was like, wow. okay, Damn. I, I guess I need to get back to this, you know, on a more regular, limited basis. But, uh, oh God. but yeah, so right at the moment, it's weights and yoga five days a week. But yeah, you know. that's good. I mean, like, you look good. You look, right, you're I, in shape. I got a well, this will air two months after that, but I do have my oncology <laughs> appointment next Monday, so we'll see how all that goes. But, but oh, you're yeah. keeping up, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, you know, our Alex and I's like routine is like unbreakable yeah (laughs) yeah we like get up we do our morning tm and then we run five miles so that's every day and then sundays uh we do a seven mile um so yeah i mean you know it's just good to do it first thing in the morning as i'm sure you know you know just gets like the brain Mm -hmm. like firing so how um, is city running for you I, again i live out in the woods and you know anytime i'm traveling back when i was running traffic lights corners i'm like i just oh yeah it's, yeah. it's horrible i mean okay. you know i mean we're doing it at like 5 30 or 6 in the morning so i mean like, the traffic isn't that bad i mean like we live downtown boston and so but like we run into south boston which is more like residential but you know there's still like people on their way to work and you know it, it is you know, that it's, you know, like dealing with like traffic lights and then uh, construction workers on their way yeah. <laughs> to the job. And, you know, I can feel their, you know, judgment. Dismissive glare. <laughs> you know, yeah. oh, he thinks he's getting in shape. He should Fucking come to the <laughs> I don't have I'm to not, give I'm you a credit. comics artist. You, you, yeah, you don't sound like a, a Bostonian, which is something <laughs> yeah. I've always been thankful for about you. But <laughs> thanks, dude. You know, I try. <laughs> yeah, I was talking about it with my my guest yesterday in Providence as to which accent is worse. But uh, yeah, probably Boston. Yeah, that's then. what he he settled on. He was a Bostonian yeah. who who well, he was a Boston transplant who moved to uh, Providence and felt like no, no, it's it's worse in Boston. So, yeah, it's a very <laughs> similar. I don't know. I mean, I feel like people are pretending <laughs> exaggerating it <laughs> yeah. yeah definitely i mean well I, I can hear it i mean like if i watch like a walk uh walk a walk malberg a mark Wahlberg movie <laughs> like you know he, he he definitely puts it on actually we, we watched the departed recently um on patriots day you know because because <laughs> you're in boston because you're in boston yeah. and we thought it'd be funny and, like i hadn't seen it in a while and i was i was shocked at how bad the accents were i mean you know I mean, even like Wahlberg, but I mean, it's, it's kind of a given, like anyone who doesn't live here is going to get it wrong, but like, you know, like no one, like no one talks like that. To push it over the top like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like no one in the city, I should say, talks like that. I mean, maybe like in the suburbs. I mean, but that's probably true of any big city. I mean, like, you know, people in New York don't have New York accents, but if you go to Staten Island, yeah, yeah, go to Staten Island. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Real last question though. Uh, Who are you reading besides the the comics? Well, I've been reading Dracula. Yeah. Because, uh, had you read it before? I had not. And didn't you, you didn't know it was an epistolary novel? I did not. Yeah, it's weird when you have that. Oh, shit. <laughs> this is completely different than what I thought it was going to be. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it's, it's exciting. I mean, it got the brain synapses firing about that, about that technique. Um, and yeah, I'm like really digging it. I also didn't know that Bram Stoker was Irish. And um, I feel like that, that influenced a lot of the writing or... You know, because there's there's like something about like Irish writers, like like what's the word I'm looking for, like the way that they like describe things is like very like unique, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, of course, my brain just completely shut down right now. We have, we have two months before this one airs. You will think of the word and email it to me. So just don't okay. worry. I will. Yeah. But, so that's that's what I. But I just read the uh, Carl Ove. Nausgaard book, yeah. My Struggle. Like, it's, I've like, never uh, read that before. It's I've never read him, but Knausgaard. I know you, you pronounce the K because that's what a uh, uh, Norwegian writer told me the first oh, really? time I mispronounced it back when it was the biggest thing. Oh, okay. Did you read the whole shebang or just the first book? Just the first book. Yeah. So, and I mean, I found that 
like i mean i was really blown away how good that was because you know i mean I, I remember when it came out and like all the hype and it's like my struggle like what the fuck is yeah. he trying to say <laughs> you know like, who's this nazi <laughs> and, and the knockoffs uh, as i always said yeah. back then like yeah. the idea that we have a literary movement that got people in brooklyn thinking they should write more about themselves really not not a great, uh, <laughs> not not a great, great idea. Idea. <laughs> yeah i mean yeah, definitely yeah. definitely i okay. mean you know that's that's the, that's like the downside but um i really enjoyed it um and uh, there's something else. Oh, I mean, I read the new Brett Easton Ellis actually recently. Yeah. The Shards. And I really enjoyed that. I mean, that was that was a good warm up, actually, like for like a horror story. I mean, it's it's really, you know, I mean, like like all his books are like violence to yeah. the point of being like pornographic and also pornographic. But um, to the point of being violent, yeah. <laughs> to the point of being violent. Exactly. <laughs> um, and but like that was I mean, it was. I mean, I think it's his best novel, and I've like read them all. But I mean, I was I was really shocked, like how how good it is. Um, it kind of reads like a Stephen King novel too, because I just read um, what King book did I read? Oh, Pet Cemetery. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I I talked to Kyler Roberts like once a week, and we like, her birthday yesterday. It was her birthday. Yes, I dropped her a line and, and wished her a good, good one. So I did, I did yeah. too. Um, and like she. We, we like both got into King at the same time, like last year, but like she's read like way more than me. So she's like deep into Stephen King. It's really funny. <laughs> we had a, a little talk here about a, a mutual pal that we decided should stay off mic. Sorry. So, Otherwise, people say they use mine while they're inking or, or yeah. laying in black. So the cartoonists love just, you know, oh, yeah, I can hear you talk to some cartoonist or somebody while I, I you know, uh, I do that. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. I, I, it's good to know that I serve some sort of purpose, which is helping you people pass the time. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know, but but you know, it helps that you talk to other cartoonists because yeah. you know they can find it what everyone's up to. And then you can hit me up after and ask me what they talked about off mic, which we'll do now. So, right, <laughs> but Carl, nice. thanks so much for coming on again. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me, Gil. And that was Carl Stevens. His new book, Mother Nature, with Jamie Lee Curtis and Russell Goldman, is out now from Titan Comics. It is a blast. Go pick it up. Um, it's, it's, well, it's a really neat horror, eco-horror comic. You can follow Carl on Twitter and Instagram at Carl Stevens Art, Carl's with a K, and support his Patreon at Penny Comics 666. He posts uh, new pages from the, the sequel to his graphic novel about his cat, Penny, there. And you can find a lot more about Carl via his Linktree page, which is Carl Stevens, all one word. I'll have links to all this in the uh, show and episode notes for this one, but I'm not doing the whole other stuff you can do to support the show. So thank you for listening. Sorry to put you through, uh, through this voice, and I, I hope everything feels better by next week. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth, used with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memories Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. You've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. 